Hello SaaS developers, you sell your impressive software to technologically mature enterprises and they expect it to work seamlessly with all their other tools. In our previous Enterprise Ready workshop on OpenID Connect, you learned how to solve part of this problem by creating users in your application for whenever your customers' employees log in. But creating accounts for users when users log in is just one of your customer's many expectations. Your app is expected to know about users who haven't yet logged in, as well as delete employee accounts who have been removed from your customer's identity provider. In this workshop, you'll learn to solve for these problems and more using Skim. By following these steps, you'll learn how to implement Skim and architect it in a way where you can potentially provision multiple organizations if needed. Although we'll be integrating with Okta in this example, remember that almost every identity provider has Skim support, so be sure to review their Skim implementation docs closely. What is Skim, you ask? Skim stands for System for Cross-Domain Identity Management, and it is an open standard protocol that allows us to manage identities across systems, as well as manage common user lifecycle operations. So in this workshop, our goal is to build a Skim server in a SaaS app using this standard protocol and in the end, connect it to an identity provider such as Okta. I'm Simona, a developer advocate here at Okta, and I will show you how to implement Skim from experience supporting SaaS developers in their journey as they submitted their Skim application to our Okta integration network. In this workshop, we'll cover what problems does Skim solve, why do we love it, how to implement Skim, connecting to an identity provider, for example, Okta, and conclude. I hope you take away not only how to implement Skim, but also how to support provisioning from multiple organizations or tenants. In addition, I hope you will recognize that you may interface with multiple separate Skim clients. This is because your customers may be using different identity providers with different Skim clients, and that Okta is just one of them. Now let's go over what problems Skim solves. Sometimes SaaS developers want to know when a user has joined a company so they can provision them with an account, or when a user leaves a company so they can deactivate their account and tied resources. The solution to these problems is Skim as it provides near instant updates to the downstream system whenever someone joins, moves inside of, or leaves a company. It also promotes interoperability via an open standard, which means allowing systems to exchange and make use of info being shared. I've once worked with a partner who has used Skim as a solution to role-based access to resources. Now, why would we even love Skim? Well, it's a very well-designed standard, and therefore, it can be implemented across systems that are compliant. It simplifies the management of identity, thereby reducing manual admin tasks. It allows user management by providing awareness or insight of up-to-date user info versus having no governance over user info and tied resources. Above all, it contributes to improved security. And now who wouldn't want that in this day and age? Now that I've given you a little background on Skim, let's get started on building the server. Before we implement Skim, let's have a plan of how we're going to do that. I will first review the create, read, update, delete functions and JSON that are the underlying mechanisms of Skim. Next, we'll go over the prerequisites of what is needed to set up our environment. Then we'll make changes to the OpenID Connect application that accompanies this workshop. And then finally, we'll get started on actually building the Skim interface. Before we build our Skim server, let's familiarize ourselves with the functions that support it. Skim is implemented by the following RESTful API, create, read, update, delete endpoints, and JSON. We'll build an endpoint to retrieve users using the GET request. We'll also incorporate a filter in the get users request. We'll also have the ability to get users by specific ID. 
will create an endpoint for creating users using post, updating users using put, and deleting users by ID using delete. JSON is the format for requesting and responding to and from the identity provider and skim server. Now, have you seen these endpoints before? Are they familiar to you? Perhaps you've built backend applications with these API endpoints. Let's build on that knowledge. And before we begin, please note that this implementation of Skim is meant to be vendor agnostic, and we will be adding notes on how Okta implements this standard throughout the demo and at the end and the accompanying blog post to this workshop. In addition, we'll be referring to the latest version of Skim 2.0 to build the server. Now let's make sure you have the necessary prerequisites for this Skim workshop. You'll need the base application associated with this workshop. For detailed instructions, on how to use the base application or configure the base application, refer to the tutorial I've linked in the video description. Once you have set up your environment, you should have the following completed. Clone the repo as I have, have version 18 of Node, version 9 of NPM, using Git, and have a GitHub account. Now let's verify that I have the correct versions. Let's check Node first. All right, I have a acceptable version of Node and now NPM. And I also have an acceptable version of NPM. Another thing we'll need is to check out the OIDC branch. That's where we will be creating the skim server on. So let's get check out the OIDC branch, workshop branch. And we'll make a branch from here, get branch call that new branch skim workshop demo I already have this branch so I'm just going to get check out to this branch instead and we're ready to work from here I've gone ahead and opened the OIDC app in my Visual Studio Code IDE. Before we begin, we'll need to make some changes to the user table or user model. So we'll go ahead and do that. We're going to add an extra field attribute uh, called active. And this field attribute is not required by the skim standard, but it is required when we connect with Okta, and this attribute will let us know whether or not the user is active. Another thing to note is that the ID we're using is basic auto increment uh, to lessen the project's complexity, but we do recommend that you use an advanced, a more advanced uh, unique ID generator such as XID, and I'll provide more info about that in the accompanying blog post to this uh, workshop. Now that we have the necessary field attributes, I want to make some changes to the seed script file. You may have already seeded the database, but I want to demo creating orgs and users as needed. Specifically, I want to create an org to demo that our app can provision multiple separate orgs if needed, especially to accommodate your customers who may be using different IDPs with different skim clients. Let's do that. I'm going to add uh, or instantiate an org here and we'll call it portal with the domain portal.example and this API key here is important because it allows skim clients like Okta to authenticate to this protected resor resource and we'll see that in action later. I'd also like to change the usernames just for fun and to hard code some of the uh, user attributes so let's go ahead and do that. All right, so what I've done here is added or hard-coded external ID and active setting that to true. So when they are seeded into the database, I've already flipped the active flag to true. And the external ID is not a standard skim attribute, but we'll need it to interact with Okta. In fact, it's a unique identifier issued by the provisioning client and must be stored by the skim server. If you interface with other IDP providers who require this, you'll know that it is coming from the skim client and not your server, 
but you must store it in your. Let's go ahead and see the database. If you haven't already installed the dependencies, let's go ahead and do so now. And if you've already seeded the database, let's start new with the set of users that I've added here. To reset your database, we'll be using a command mpx prisma migrate reset. So I'll add that in right now just to make sure we start with a fresh database. And now we'll run initdb so that we can add the users that we've just hard coded here. All right, so we have Somnus and Trinity now in the database. And to make sure of that, we have a neat way to see the database through locally provided by Prisma. So let's add MPX Prisma Studio to, and then I will show you what the database looks like. All right, so we have Somnus and Trinity tied to org1 with external ID 22 and 23, and they're both active, exactly what we wanted. External ID and active field attributes are standard uh, attributes in the skin protocol. They're not the core attributes. The core attributes are ID, username, and meta. Those are the only attributes that are required for the course user schema. External ID and active are optional attributes. As Okta requires them, we're adding it here. So now we'll need to make more changes to the application. We'll need to add a skim.ts file, and we'll also need to make some changes to the main TS file. So let's go ahead first and add a skim file for our routes. Let's just call that skim TS. And here we'll define our routes for our router. We'll import them to main. And then at the very bottom, we'll instruct the app to use um, or mount the routes onto this skim URL. Let's just add it here. The skim protocol doesn't exactly define the route that we need. In fact, they only require v2, but I'm adding skim slash v2 as this is the required URL format that Okta recommends. Now let's get started on building the skim server. We'll need to build each of the CRUD functions I mentioned earlier and format the responses in JSON. From here, we'll test our functions with Postman to see that we're interacting with the server and receiving the responses according to the spec. Let's first import Express and Prisma, then let's create a variable to instantiate the Prisma client to be able to access user data. Then we'll add a variable for org ID to tie these users to org1. We'll add here a helpful interface to help us define the type of data that we expect to receive from the request coming to our server. Now we'll go ahead and build our first CRUD endpoint, and that is to create a user. I'll go ahead and explain what the code is doing here. Um, so when a request to create a user comes in, it's processed and um, we check to see if the user exists. If the user already exists, we'll output a response 409, uh, HTTP status and a 409 and a response saying that the user already exists. If the user doesn't exist, we'll go ahead and create the user by um, sending a request to create the user and then to the, to the database. And then we'll also send back a HTTP status of uh, 201 and we'll also send back a user response, a helpful user response in JSON. And this um, adds the core schema, which we have um, added in the beginning. And, and also it passes the user that was just created. 
Now that we have our first endpoint, let's go ahead and test it. We'll use Postman to check our work to make local requests to the server. And before we do that, we'll need to protect this endpoint with the API token that we created when we provisioned an org in the beginning. First, let's add or install Passport Bearer, Passport HTTP Bearer, which is a module that would help us. Okay, let's first exit out of this and install Passport HTTP Bearer. We'll then import it to our main TS file. We'll also create a variable. And lastly, we'll add the necessary code to use it. I will put it under our skim related actions. I like that. we'll be able to delineate which are our skim related routes and that should be good there. Now that we have bear auth available, let's go ahead and add that to our skim route. We'll go ahead and add it to our create user route like so. We'll still need to add two more things before we test with Postman. The next thing we're going to add is body parser. Body parser will allow us to uh, accept the header content type, which will be sent to a server as application skim plus JSON. And I'll show you what that looks like. But first let's install body parser. All right, let's import it in our main.ts file. We'll also add it to our skim related actions. And that's good. Last thing we'll need to add is Morgan. And Morgan is a, an extension I'm using to help me see the request come through our server. First, we'll need to install Morgan before we import it. Great. And then we'll import it. All right, I've gone ahead and added Postman here. And I've already, I already have the requests that I want to test with the server. Uh, let's first test the create user request. And to do that, we'll run the server. Looks like I have an error. And the error points to cannot find name passport. I must have not imported passport. So let's add that over and try again. All right, looks like it's happy. We'll send over post request. I get a response unauthorized. I want to double check that I have the correct API key. So let's double check that that's correct. That was in our seed script. Looks like I have the wrong API, so let's just add the correct one. And I also noticed that I don't have Morgan running. So let's check on that. And that would be under main. So I've imported Morgan, but did I actually add it to my skim actions? I did not. I'm going to add Morgan here and it looks like that's happy and we'll send it again. This error I'm very familiar with and it's because I've not added or included body parser somehow. Body parser is needed so that when we send application slash skim plus json which is according to the spec you need to do this so let's go back to main.ts so i'll go ahead and add that let's try again it's happy with that I'll try to add the user okay that was 201 created i now have a user test user 
and I'll go ahead and double check that using in Prisma Studio. I'd like to show you that my user had come through with an external ID, an email, and active set to true. I want to pause here and explain a few things. I added some console.log so that you can see uh, the requests coming in to, through post. And I see that we are responding with that the user has been created. And also, I wanted to mention that the handy tool extension Morgan also let me know that a post has come through to my user's endpoint and that I responded with a 201. Okay, let's move forward. We have one endpoint down and we have six more to go. So let's get to it. Now we're going to focus on the get uh, endpoint and I'm going to add some code to retrieve users and let's talk about the code that I'm adding. According to the spec, we can return users and return them paginated. We've added that here and I'll show you what that looks like in Postman. Filtering for username is optional and I we've decided to put that here because Okta requires it when it creates a user, it will look for the user's username to make sure that they don't already exist before creating the user. This is just code to be able to filter through uh, the query params and also handle filter if a username has been sent. And then again, that's going to give us back a response and we'll get to see that here in Postman. All right, let's run the server and hit our get users endpoint, passing in the necessary API, content type in the headers. All right, so we get a pagination back or a response back to the pagination, um, start indexing at one, and we get back Somnus, Trinity, and test user. All good. Morgan even tells me that I'm getting a get response from Postman, and I'm responding with 200 with a list of users. Good to know. Now let's test get users with a filter. Username, I've added trinity at portal.example. Let's send that over. And I get a 200 response with trinity, with trinity's info. Let's try building the get specific user endpoint. Just going to add it here. You can pause the video at any time if you'd like to try building the endpoint on your own challenging yourself to build it on your own. And I'm just going to continue along here. So this endpoint will process a user ID that you provide. And let's see if the user exists, it'll return a 200. And if not, it'll return a 404. So let's get the first user. And sure enough, we get Somnus. And that's correct. All right, let's now move right along to our put endpoint. Um, also, at any point that you want to pause this video to try to write the endpoints yourself, feel free to do so. I'll just go ahead and continue. And this time, I've added a put uh, endpoint. And this is to um, check to see if there are any changes um, on the user's info, email, name, and to update that. So let's go ahead and test that out. I'm going to change uh, the user, test user, to let's say 
new, new test user. So we'll change their username to that. Some change like that. And let's see that change happen. Again, I've console.logged the request coming in as well. We get a 200 response back. And if I go to check our Prisma database, I see that new test user has been updated. Let's move on to delete now. All right, for our delete section, it's pretty straightforward. We are finding a user by ID and we're deleting them. So let's go ahead and delete user three by passing in their ID. And we get a 204. Uh, no response is valid according to the spec. And if I were to take a look at our Prisma database, I should not see the test user anymore. So that worked. I want to add a, a soft delete option. And this is not required by some identity providers, but it is required by Okta. And in the skim protocol, it's referred to as a partial update. And what we're going to do here is a soft delete wherein we set the active attribute to false. I'm going to send in the body, I'm going to deactivate a user by sending a false value. And I'm going to change user to Trinity. And let's see what that does for us. Okay, it set, says that it went through 204. And if I were to refresh this, I see in the database that Trinity's active flag is set to false. And so this is good if we want to keep users for audit purposes. Um, Okta wants to be able to reprovision users if necessary, um, say they come back um, from being deprovisioned we can reprovision them again. I know that was a lot of work. Congratulations on making it this far. You now have a functional skim server. So with that, let's see what we what fun we can do with it, such as connecting to an identity provider like Okta. We're going to plan out how we're going to do this. The first thing we'll need to do is set up a local tunnel, which will allow us to expose our local server to the web and allow Okta to reach us at a public URL. We'll then need to create an Okta developer account so that we can then create a skim application, which is the skim client that will be making requests to our server. And lastly, we'll test common user lifecycle actions such as import, provision, and deprovision. Let's get started. Next thing we need to do before connecting to Okta is to run a local tunnel. In fact, the service that we'll be using is called Local Tunnel. We'll need this to be able to expo expose our local server to the web and for Okta to reach us via public URL. So with that, we'll go ahead and run our server. Also, something to note, this app is already configured for a local tunnel, so all we need to do is call it. OK, our server is running, and now We'll tell local tunnel what port our server is running, and we should get back a public URL. Fair chicken, enjoy. I find that the combination of strings that or random strings that lo this local tunnel service sometimes is gives is is funny. So I hope you get one too. Go ahead and keep this, and we'll need it when we connect with Okta. Okay, now we'll need to create a developer account. If you go to developer.octa.com slash sign up, you should be able to choose from the different account options, and one of them being the Okta Developer Edition, which is a free forever account type here at Okta. I've already got my account, and I'm going to go ahead and create the skim application. We'll need to go to Browse App Catalog, 
and search for the Skim template app, specifically the Skim 2.0 test app header. We'll add that. This is a good enough name. We'll bypass the SSO option for now. And we'll head on to the provisioning tab and enable our integration. So remember that local tunnel URL I asked you to save. We'll go ahead and post it here. OK, so I've added my base URL and appended skim slash v2 to the API integration and added my bearer token as well. And I got a confirmation from Okta saying that I was able to authenticate successfully. And I see that it sent a request to my server to the get endpoint, and uh, we've established a connection. It took me a few tries to get local tunnel to work. So just as a note, um, this is good for development purposes only, uh, de development purposes only, um, but you may use NGROC also as another tunneling service and or maybe do a deployment to test. All right, let's save this and move on forward. Now we'll need to enable some CRUD functions on the Okta side. So let's go ahead and enable create users, enable update user attributes, and deactivate users. Let's go ahead and save that. As you know, we have two users, Somnus and Trinity, in our Skim server. So let's sync them over to Okta so that we can have visibility of all users in our database and designate Okta as the source of truth about users assigned to this app or organization. So we'll hit the Import Now button. And Okta gathers that there are two users in our downstream database. We'll say OK. I've had to add last names for Somnus and Trinity um, because Okta did not allow that they didn't have last names. So I went ahead and did that with our handy dandy CRUD functions now. I was able to update the, the users to have last names. So we'll confirm assignment. And if we look under assignments, they're added to Okta. Now let's try adding a new user through Okta. So we'll go add a user and we'll name this user Tom and their last name Anderson and we'll give them tom.anderson at portal.example.com and save this user We'll also need to add their username as the email and save that. And let's then add them to the application. Tom Anderson. And there we go, he's provisioned. And let's see, we have a request from Okta to add a new user. And we'll double check with Prisma and we'll do a refresh. And we have Tom now in the database and they are active. Now let's say Mr. Anderson no longer wants to work for Portal. We'll need a way to unassign him from the app or deactivate him from the app. We can do that by unassigning him the app here. And when that happens, a patch request is sent to our server and setting active to false. If I do a refresh, and that does the soft delete that we coded for in the server. OK, now let's say he returns because he realizes that Portal is, in fact, the best place to work. 
and he'll need to be reassigned to the app. So we can go ahead and do that by assigning him the app, like so. And once this is done, another patch request is sent to reactivate him back and that you can see here. So then we'll double check in our database that he is in fact set back to true. And now let's look at one last scenario. Let's say not only does Mr. Anderson return, would like to be called Leo. So we'll need a way to update user info and fear not because our skim server can handle this. So we'll go to his account and we'll go to his profile and change his name to Leo. And once I make the changes, our downstream app is notified and we can see in our database that the changes have come through. Well, there you have it. I have demonstrated common user lifecycle management scenarios from our skim connection with Okta. You can certainly repurpose the server now to work with other skim compliant identity providers as needed. Now let's conclude this workshop. If you've been following along, you now have an OpenID Connect app with skim provisioning. Your users can now authenticate securely with OIDC and make use of this application once they've been provisioned and assigned this resource from an identity provider such as Okta. If you want to continue building on your server, I have added a section called Where to Go From Here on the blog post accompanying this video, which I will link in the description, as well as a section on my tool recommendations for testing your SKIM server. To recap, I have shown you how to implement SKIM in a SaaS app and implement it in a way that can potentially support provisioning from multiple orgs. In learning how to implement the server, I hope you recognize that you may interface with multiple separate SKIM clients, as it is possible for your customers to be leveraging different IDPs with different SKIM clients. And lastly, please give me a thumbs up if this workshop was helpful to you. And also, please comment below if you have any questions. I'd be happy to answer. And as all our proof of concept projects and SDKs are open source, we invite you to initiate a pull request if there's something you want us to improve upon. And as always, please like and subscribe to OctaDev for more helpful videos.